Thank you everyone for coming again. We're up to the bracha of Re'e Von Yehum. It's titled in some siturum as Geula. I don't know, maybe if someone has the page in the art school English. Okay, 102. One, 102, thank you very much, thank you. I'm sorry? Could you translate, please? Could I translate what? What you just said, what the bracha was. Oh, I'm sorry. Re'evon yenu, see, see our, our, our affliction. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so this bracha, now it's interesting. Again, we're not going to get into the sequence regarding every bracha, but this is a point that Gemara raises in Masechus Megillah, Daf, Yudzayin, and Beis. That the sequence between the last bracha from last time, Shlach Lanu, and Re'evon Yenu, and Rafa'enu Hashem Vene Rafe, is all based on a Pasuk in Tehillim, Perek Kuf Gimel of Tehillim, Hasoleach Lechol Avonaichi, that God forgives all of your sins, Harofei Lechol Tachuaichi, that God heals all of your illnesses, Hagoel Mishachas Chayoichi, that He redeems your life from the depths. So it's based on that sequence. Now, I don't mean to get too technical, but if it's based on that sequence, then it's out of order. In other words, the first it should be Geula, first it should be Slicha, excuse me, then it should be healing, and then it should be redemption, and, and numbers two and three are flipped. So the Gemara says an interesting thing. The Gemara says, and it just gives you a snippet of the depth of the intention behind the format of Shmona Esrei, and certainly the words of Shmona Esrei, the Gemara says that the bracha of redemption, which is the bracha that we're doing tonight, beginning with Goel Yisrael, the Redeemer of Israel, uh, is logical to be the seventh blessing of Shemona Esrei. And the reason it's logical to be the seventh blessing of Shemona Esrei, we won't get into the details now, but there is a source that the ultimate redemption of Klal Yisrael will begin in the seventh year of the Shemitah cycle. In other words, actually, to really get into technicalities, the Gemara says that, you know, there's a famous tradition that there's some type of war that precedes the coming of the redemption. That happens in the seventh year. And, and then the ultimate redemption comes in the eighth year. Um, and if I was a really good rabbi, I would now tell you exactly when that will be. But uh, <laughs> sorry, that didn't, I didn't make that one in school. Uh, so, so it makes sense that the bracha of redemption should be the seventh bracha. And then it also is logical that the bracha of healing should be the eighth bracha, for a very famous reason, something to do with the number eight. Brismila. So that's one of the classic examples of someone who needs to be healed. Glad there's no Moalim in attendance. I hope no one will be offended by it, but it is pretty common uh, that, that, that there needs to be healing after bris. So that's on the eighth day. So basically, it's the spirit of that Pasuk with this little inversion. But this is what the Gemara says, an interesting thing. Um, also, just as a means of introduction, Rashi in the Gemara and Megillah says a, a fascinating point that if you look at this bracha and you think this bracha is about the ultimate redemption, you're actually incorrect. Even though, even though the bracha ends with saying, Oh, El Yisrael, I mean, this is the Redeemer. He says, you have other brachos in Shemona Esrei about the ultimate redemption and the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash and things of that sort. This is about redemption from our day-to-day -day challenges. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Again, this is Rashi on the Gemara. This is not like a fanciful, you know, vort somewhere. This is, he says, the pshat in this bracha, it's a fascinating way to think about this bracha. The pshat in this bracha is... Klal Yisrael is constantly, whether it be on a national level, whether it be we as people, constantly have great challenges. And this bracha is asking us for redemption, asking God to give us redemption from each of these challenges along the way. And the big, broad redemption that we talk about later. So that's a very interesting, very interesting thing to think about. And just one more point along those lines, Rav Shimon Schwab points out, there are so many calamities or potential calamities that we don't even know about. You know, it's a fascinating thing to think about what we're asking God for help with. I'm reminded, I, I believe it's, it's a mushal, it's a parable from the Dubna Magid. I, I don't remember definitively, but it goes something like this, that there was a, a wealthy man, all good mushals start with either a wealthy or poor man, one or the other. <laughs> uh, there was a wealthy man who also was unfortunately blind. And there were some fellows who wanted to rob him, but he actually had very strong security in the home. So they decided, he went on a daily walk, and uh, they decided that one day they would dig a hole, they watched his route very closely, 
they would dig a hole, cover it up with some straw and the like. Uh, you know, when he would go with his cane, with his stick, it would seem like it was regular ground. He would fall in. They'd be good Samaritans and pull him out of the pit and then bring him home to make sure he was all right. And once they were in his house, he would, they, would, they would wrap his home. And they're waiting there, waiting there, waiting there. And um, he's walking. And for some inexplicable reason, that given day, he decides to turn around and drop early. And, and so just, just imagine the redemption that God brings him in that moment, and only the bad guys know. The good guys don't even appreciate the redemption. Uh, you know, it's something we can so relate to, specifically in our times. God should protect us. God should always protect us. But uh, the, 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 the perils of terrorism today, I, I was once speaking about this in another context in Shoal, and uh, one of the members who's very involved with intelligence and things of that sort, I mean, there's no way realistically we could say that the only reason we haven't been struck by more serious uh, terrorist attacks is because of our top-notch security. I mean, thank God we have wonderful security within our country, but a tremendous amount must be divine protection. I mean, there's no, there's no way we can catch all the, there's no way. I mean, so it's a, it's a remarkable thing to think about, that part of what we're asking Hashem for, and by extension, if we're asking Him, that means we're also thanking Him for all the things, because we realize He's the source of these things things that we don't even know about, <coughs> dangers that we don't even know about. Okay, so let's, let's get started. Re'eva anyenu, see, you could really translate this in, in one of two ways. I think it's most more logical to translate see our affliction. Is that how they translate it into arts? We'll see, oh, yeah. see our, our what? Suffering. Our suffering, okay. Behold our affliction. Behold our affliction, okay, great. The Riva Rivenu and champion our cause, and redeem us quickly for the sake of your name, because you are a strong redeemer. Now let's just think about this for a moment. What's our point? You know, if, if our point is that God should help us, let's cut to the chase. See our, see our affliction. Do you, do you got, want God to like applaud for you now? I mean, it, it, it sounds like a, like a child looking for attention. Say to God, fight our cause, champion our cause. Why, why see our affliction? So the Reba Yakar quotes a very interesting Medrash in Tehillim. It's, it's Medrash Tehillim, Perak Mem Dalim. And in the Medrash, the Jewish people ask Hashem, when will the Geula, when will the redemption ultimately come? And his answer is that when Klal Yisrael reach a uniquely low point of, of pain, despair, etc., then the time will come for the redemption. And that actually is based on a juxtaposition of verses in the 44th chapter in Tehillim. It says in one verse, Ki our souls have bent down to the ground. Then it says, Kumaz Rasalanu, God rise up and help us. So actually, the Rebbe Yaakov explains that the point of this bracha is along those lines. Hashem, See how difficult it's become for us. And if you, if you appreciate and see how difficult it's become for us, that in of itself should be a merit or a cause for our redemption. It also, of course, brings to mind the Psukim by Egypt. Um, there's definitely a Pasuk in the mix over there that God sees the travail of the Jewish people. Um, so we're asking him to respond to the difficulty of the challenge. And, and the fact that it's so difficult should be itself the impetus for our redemption. It's an interesting thing to think about. Now, redeem us speedily, Laman Shemecha, for the sake of your name. What does that have to do with God's name? So the Rebbe Yakar explains, it's really based on the Pasuk in Yeshaya. The Pasuk in Yeshaya refers to the fact that Go'aleinu Hashem Tzvakov Shema. Our Redeemer's name is God. So in other words, part of the essence of how we look at you is as our Redeemer. So if you indeed redeem us, that it reinforces our understanding of you. Okay. Um, and then we well, also, you know, let me just you know, let me finish the bracha and then we'll um, Baruch Atu Hashem, Goel Yisrael, uh, blessed art thou God, the Redeemer of Israel. By the way, just for all you Chazanim out there, um, forgive me if I tilt this way. Um, for all you for all you Chazanim out there, there's this is a common mistake. The, the, the ending of the bracha before Shemona Esrei is Ga'al Yisrael, that we emphasize that he redeemed Israel, and this bracha of Shemona Esrei is he does redeem Israel. Now, Rav Schwab just points out that this grammar, 
very much speaks to the point that we began with. This is not about the fact of the ultimate redemption. If it was about the ultimate redemption, it would be somewhat strange that we say it in the present tense. It would be the one who will redeem Israel. That's not what the bracha is about. The bracha is about the fact that we believe through all these challenges and all these difficulties, God's help, God helps us left and right. And we just ask him to continue to do so. Back to Shainzim. Since we just had two bosses of the Talmud, and then Laney and Moshe appealing to Hashem, and one of the arguments is, you know, everybody also say, hey, Hashem, you brought us out just to this. So it's a desecration of Hashem's name if we have a problem. Right, right. In the, end, in the end of the day, if things go off the Jewish people, it, it's, uh, it's a sanctify, sanctification of God's name. <coughs> but it's very interesting. If we think of the redemption from problems as being the focus of this bracha, it, it makes a big difference to go Lein Meir Alaman Shemecha because if you make it clear, if God makes it clear that he's there for me in my time of difficulty, then the whole way that I relate to God will change. And that's not really God's problem per se, but it would be wonderful of him to help us in that regard. Again, it's our job to see it. It's our job to see it when it happens. But that kind of, seems to be kind of part of the focus of this brother. Aaron, would you want to say something? How do you understand the word shame? As opposed to just the Ula. Well, it doesn't talk about Ula Shleim here. Oops. I got this part Oh. Oh, that's, uh... Listen, I want to tell you something. I have a rough enough time. Uh, for the record, by the way, I, I, I think it was, yeah, it was last week. I don't think uh, you, you all were, were kind enough to let me skate by on it. So I referred at the beginning of the pas of a, pas of the bracha of Atachonein to Chachma Bina and Das. I referred to that. And then people were, were kind enough to just ask questions about Chachma Bina and Das and not make the point of you were talking about Chachma Bina and Das and you never tied it back. Um, what I realized afterwards is the commentary I was looking at must have been looking at the Nusach Svard uh, edition, which has Chachma Bina and Das. So last week was our taste of Nusach Svard, and this week I'm just going to try to focus on Das Kanazi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, anything else before we go on? Okay. Uh, the next bracha is, is of course, a bracha that I, I, I think uh, holds a special significance for so many of us. Uh, the bracha of Rufa'inu, that we ask for the sick to be healed. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, by the way, just before anything, people were asking last time about inserts in, in, in davening. The point was made last week, which is certainly true, that this is a famous bracha that we regularly insert things in the Shmona right? Uh, anyone who sees an art scroll sitter should see before the Kikel Mela, there's a, like a little asterisk or mark or something, and there's a place to insert prayers uh, for the sick. Um, I, I should just mention, it, it's a very common question, who should get a Mishabera? Uh, you know, what, what, what stage do you give someone a Mishabera? It's, it's a commonly asked question. Um, as, as, a general, as a general rule, first of all, if within the normal mode of medicine there's no way for the person to get better, we normally don't daven that they should be healed. In other words, if, if heaven forbid a person is in an incurable condition, uh, to daven, yeah. we, we, know, we aren't supposed to daven for miracles normally. That doesn't mean that we don't believe God can do that miracle, but we normally don't daven for miracles. Now, having said that, we can certainly daven, and I frequently tell this to people, we can certainly daven, let's say a person is in a chronic condition, we can certainly daven that they shouldn't have pain and things of that sort. Um, as a general rule, the Mishaberachs and Shul, like during laning, the people who Mishaberach should be said to them are people who are currently ill and there are hopes of that illness being cured in, in, in one way or another. Um, Again, forgive me for saying, I don't mean to be flippant about it, just, just if, if I give examples, people should understand a little bit better what I mean. If a person has a handicap and there's no realistic method by which that handicap will be healed, it doesn't really make sense to make, make, make a mishabera for them. We could dab it for them in our private tefillos so that everything should go well for them, but it's, it's a little bit. Um, so also traditionally in the shul mishabera, traditionally that's a mishabera we make for people who are, who are seriously ill. So that's if a person, uh, has a fever that day and stayed home from work that wasn't someone we would normally make a mishabara for at Lamey that day. Uh, on the other hand, in our private tefillos, there it's a much wider, it's a much wider range. I would still say that we should, we should be diving for something concrete for the person, 
Again, it has to be that there's something that the medical team is working for or hoping for or something like that. But uh, there's a much wider range of people that it makes sense to be making Mishaberach for in our private philos. Of course, at the end of the Mishaberach here, we say, B'soch Sharkal Yisrael, among all, among all the sick of Israel. Okay, now, this, this point was made last week. Um, I believe Bernie made the point last week that, you know, brachos are always in the plural. This is always in the plural. This bracha is one of the more stark examples of it because it's based on a pasuk from um, Yirmiyahu, Rufa'eni Hashem ve'e Rafe, heal me God and I'll be healed. And we, of course, say Rufa'eni Hashem, Rufa'eni heal us God, ve'nei Rafe, and we'll be healed. And, and so it's really strong here because we're actually taking a pasuk and changing its form for the sake of this bracha. So this is a place that many of the commentators point out how much this is clearly our traditional approach to prayer that we, if we're davening for one person, for myself, for someone else, we daven for everybody. And uh, this is probably the strongest, if not one of the strongest examples of this in, in Shemona Esrei. Rufa'enu um, Hashem v'nei rafei. Heal us, God, and we'll be healed. Hoshienu v'nivashea. Save us, and we'll be saved. Ki silasenu ata. Because you are our salvation. You are the source of our praise. Rav Schwab makes a very interesting point. What we're really saying in this bracha, it's a powerful thing to think about, what we're really saying in this bracha is, if we are healed, or the person for whom we're davening is healed, we are committing ourselves to seeing it as the hand of God. If you heal us, we'll be healed. What does that mean? What's the flip of that? That means if we're healed, we see that as coming from you. Now, that is not to say that we shouldn't owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the doctors and the researchers. Of course we do. But we believe that we need to thank God for their wisdom. Uh, we need to thank God for sending us to the right doctor. And obviously many times the best of doctors can do all the right things and it still doesn't work out. And for that we also thank God if it worked out for a person. It's a fascinating hashkafic statement within the davening. And this is one of many examples of davening. I don't know if we've said this yet or not. I always tell people I, I don't listen well to my own presentation. So I don't know if I mentioned this or not. but. Many ways tefillah is not only speaking to God, but many ways tefillah is speaking to ourselves as to reminding ourselves how we're supposed to look to God and how we're supposed to see our relationship with God. So it's, it's a powerful thought by Rav Schwab. Now, another point that he makes is if you look at the context of this Pasuk in Yirmi, and again, if anyone wants to look it up later, it's Perak Yud Zayin Pasuk Yud Dalet. The, the mode of healing in the Pasuk by Yirmiya is very much about spiritual repair. And again, no, we're not saying Vortlach, right? if you look it up in Yirmiya, there, there, there are a number of references within these Pasukim of healing that seem to be very clear talking about <coughs> spiritual healing. So he suggests that at least the first part of the bracha of Shemona Esrei is not only speaking about physical healing. It's talking about spiritual, emotional healing also. I mean, just to give, just to give a muscle for a moment. You know, how, many, how many times, whether it be in our own lives or in the lives of others, do people have an experience that affects them, and unfortunately many times in a negative way, <coughs> affects them for a lifetime? And, and again, also here, you know, Baruch Hashem, there are so many wonderful professionals that we can go to to help us, et cetera. But whether it be emotional, whether it be spiritual, there's so many things that we could ask God to help us heal. It's not only necessarily something in the human anatomy, per se. So that's the, the point that Rav Schwab makes on the first part of the bracha. And then the bracha continues, and present a refuah shleima, a complete healing, to all of those of us who are wounded. Now here he says, this sounds pretty physical at this point. So he, he kind of suggests that the first part of the bracha is more spiritual, emotional, 
second part of the bracha is more physical. And by the way, this fits with something we talk about a lot, refuas hanefesh, refuas haguf, a healing of the soul and a healing of the body. So according to that, this is kind of what we're talking about here too, healing of, of, of our soul in different ways and healing of our body in different ways. Kikel melech rofein emon v'rachamon ata. Because you are a god, a king, a trustworthy healer, and compassionate. There's a lot of descriptions in this one phrase. And Rav Schwab points out that the descriptions seem to be at odds with each other. What's the definition of a compassionate healer? So to be very honest, I would say a compassionate healer is someone who does what he does with a, with a, a, a spirit of kindness. I mean, that, that's, I don't know what any of you would say. That's, that's, what I, I, that's what I personally would say. But Rav Schwab suggests that what it means to be a compassionate healer almost implies that there are certain things that the healer does or doesn't do based on a spirit of compassion. Uh, uh, a reliable, faithful healer is presumably not moved by how much it'll hurt, presumably they're moved by what's going to be the most effective approach. So he says, Orofei, Neamon, and Rachamon are not necessarily on the same page. Uh, maybe, maybe something that can resonate with us more, Kale is one of the names of God that connotes mercy. Melech, king, doesn't sound like a very merciful name. So he, he finds it to be a little bit at odds the kale and the melech, and the rofei namon v'rachamon. It just seems to be a little bit stretching in, in, in two directions. And he suggests an interesting thing. I, 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 before I say what I'm going to say, this is one, one, one wonderful commentator's thought, and, it, it, and even with this thought, certainly it's not necessarily true across the board in life. But just to say it, sometimes the illness itself could be a gift from God <coughs> for, for whatever reason it might be. It, 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 it could be the illness is some type of atonement. It could be the illness is an opportunity for a person to gain greater clarity in this world. Uh, it could be the illness is an impetus for the person to, to, to think about who they are. <coughs> it's a very interesting thing. There was a movie, um, it was based on a book. I don't want to disappoint you. The reason I know about this movie and the book is uh, it was written by, the book was written by a fellow by the name of Rosenbaum, who was some like, second, third cousin of mine. And those are the only movies I know about. <laughs> um, they, had, they had an any movie that came out before like the early 90s, whatever. <laughs> but um, but, but uh, there was a, the movie called The Doctor. I don't know if any of you remember it. It was William Hurt, I believe, who was, was in the movie. So um, the, the, the topic of the doctor was uh, the, the, the fellow was an oncologist who himself came down, was found to have cancer. And it was a tremendous uh, self-discovery of sort of how it feels from the other side of the table. And it's just an interesting mushroom. Now, I mentioned my mother last week, I'll mention my mother again. Whenever my mother talks about this movie, she very emphatically says that the actual author of the book, the, this Eddie Rosenbaum, was an extremely compassionate doctor. The movie has it very, very cold and callous, and, but, but still it was, it was a tremendous uh, experience for him. But just take that as a muscle for a moment. Many, many times people suffer from illness. It's a very powerful opportunity to reflect a little bit on so many different things. And so, especially if you think of part of the bracha, being kind of spiritual healing, sometimes God giving us the illness and hopefully the healing within the illness, the illness is a Rachmanus from God sometimes. Sometimes the illness is in its own way a gift because it's an opportunity for perspective. I want to reiterate, this is not necessarily true across the board. It's a very powerful thought, far easier said than just randomly applied to people's lives. But, but, but it's an interesting thing to think about. And that in your Rachmanis, in sometimes giving the person the illness, you are a, a faithful healer within that mode. It's an interesting thing to think about. And then we, we uh, thank God, bless God.
for being the Rofei Cholei Amon Yisrael, for the healer of, of the members of Israel who are sick. Yes. Questions? Please, yeah. So the, the phrase, Ki Yisihu Eseinu Oto, doesn't really seem to fit comfortably in there. Um, you translate it as you are the source of our praise, meaning you're the, the cause of our praise. Right, right. Reason, yeah. Right. Um, but you could read the prayer without that phrase in it, and it seems to flow much better because you're giving the praise at the end. You're actually saying it to God. Right. In those praise, praising terms, Kelmah, for saying that. Right. right? So, um, especially if you translate it, the key is because it doesn't seem to flow right. You heal us uh, and we'll be healed and save us and we'll be saved because, because you are the source of our praise. Yeah, I think it's a very you fair point. I think it's a very fair point. Um, it is based on the Apostle from Yirmiyah, which I, I believe does end off Kisilasi uh, Ata. Um, it is interesting, if you think of it in light of the way Rav Schwab looked at the Pasuk, it, it actually does somewhat resolve your point in the sense that it, heal me God and I'll be healed is in another sense saying if I'm healed I'll see it as coming from you. So if, if that's the accompanying meaning of the phrases then it's a statement that I recognize that you are the appropriate direction, you are the, the, the appropriate source to which my praise should be directed. I think so. I think it's a very fair point. Thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to say that my mother has several doctors with them, and every time she's had to go in for surgery, um, the doctors, you know, scheduling it, have said, I'm going to go to shul that morning and I'll do it, make a fair for you. And it's been an enormous source of comfort to her. So I just mentioned this if there are any doctors in the audience. It's such a small thing, but it like, is it's the thing that she holds on to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone else, Beryl? Yeah, I just have an observation. Um, in some of the previous rapport that we spoke about, especially the ones where we're Mavakesh, you know, Slicha and Rachamim, we use the terminology uh, Avinu. And, you know, it appeals to me that I don't have a problem with any of the words that are in the Brahma the way that it is, but it seems like that reference is missing. And, it seems like all the times that you'd really like God to relate to us, a father to a child, that it, it would be a time when you know you're ill and you really need help. I think it's a very interesting point. I appreciate you sharing that. I don't know why this is, but it seems the reference to Avinu is actually the, except, the exception and not the rule. I do, I do want to credit Alan Boldiger was kind enough to mention. I said that Avinu shows up twice in Shemona Esrei. There is a reference to Avinu in the Bracha of Sim Shalom, I, be, I believe you mentioned, right? Did I, right? So that was, um, that was a good point. <laughs> but uh, other than that, to the best of my knowledge, these, the, the, the two Brachos you referred to, of Hashivenu Avinu L'Sarosecha, and Slachlanu Avinu Kichatanu, at least one of the Mepharshim points out, these are the two brachos that refer to God as our Father. And he, we had a whole thing of what was special about these two brachos. Why it's not a more common thing in Shemona Esri to refer to God as our Father, I'm not sure. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really see that addressed. Um, I think it's a, very, it's a very fair point to think about. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thing. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer to your... But just the, only thing I'm, the only thing I would answer to you is the Avina was more the exception, not the rule. Why that is, I don't know. Max? Maybe, there are, maybe it's because there are two polarities when we talk about Shem. One is Emes, uh, judgment, and the other one is Chesed. And uh, the Ne'eman, which is maybe rhymes, which is an echo of Emes, is the, uh, that part of the, uh, the, uh, the den, the judgment, the, 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 the justice. And he figures it out uh, however he does. So uh, we pray for Ted. There's always more balance towards the Avinu and to the, to the Rahamim. There's also the fact that Hashem wants order, he wants them, he wants Emes. And that balance, he figures out how he wants to do it. Thank you. I mean, that could very, uh, certainly could very well be. I mean, I think there's something I, I was thinking about that kind of was charged by what Max said, which is I, I'm not sure the way we should be relating to God is asking him somewhat of the connotation of Avinu is. So to just, why don't just this one time, why don't you kind of, 
forget the, the you know, one to kind of forget the normal structure of, of, of how things would normally be and just kind of overlook it this, this, this one time. Um, and, and if that's the standard mode for how we relate to him, that sort of becomes a little bit of an unhealthy. Uh, so the two brachos that we spoke about, Avinu, was he should bring us close to his Torah. So that is actually, I need to see myself as not only a subject, I need to see this as core to who I am as a person, and God is my father. And Slach Don Avinu, at the end of the day, all these other things, in a sense, stem from God's forgiving our shortcomings. So that's the one time, like, we pull out the, you know, we pull out the Avinu card. Maybe. I mean, that's sort of similar in the sense to what Max was talking about. What is it how you pull out? We ask him for forgiveness. I mean, you know, if he's willing to forgive us, then so many of these other requests come a drop easier. Would you say Avinu Malkeinu Shlach before Shlach Yes. Yes, so, so the Avinu Malkeinu, the Avinu Malkeinu Dabnins, which we, which we said on, on Shavas Matamash just a few days ago, um, those are clearly impassioned pleas of God. Uh, it's very striking, right? Even when, when Yom Kippur is on Shabbos, we, we, we refrain from <coughs> saying the Avinu Malkeinu because the tone of them are so, it's like not, not in step with Shabbos. Um, so these are, that's clearly where we're pulling out all our stops, whether it be that we're saying during the Seyes of or on a fast day. Someone else? Yes. Is that that's like a play? You could translate it that way. Yes. A maka is 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 a striking. So that could be a hit. That could be a wound. Could be a maka. Wounds are the a play. Could be a maka. Everything in between. Yeah. So those could be considered like a play. Maybe uh, you know I, I I I mean literally maka could be is it means a wound yeah 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 maka means a, a hit so it could be it's, it's, it's a broad word the, the stroke thank you thank you I just was thinking yeah yeah I mean that's a very strong context <coughs> of it that's not that's not the exclusive in the context of the word yeah thank you, yeah, thank you. one more point on sure. the uh, the use of the, which term for God <coughs> the model from the Torah that Moses used was kill no for the that's a wonderful point. To, to just, just, to, just to, so we refer to God here as Kael Melech. So when Moshe davens for a healing for his sister Miriam, Kael Na Rifan Allah. So that the Kael is the way God's referred to by Moshe. So it, it, it's very fitting. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the bracha of Baruch Aleinu. Baruch Aleinu is an extremely relevant bracha uh, for all of society, and it's basically the bracha of Parnassa. You know, so it, it, it measures the bracha through the mode of an agricultural society that God should bless the crops of the year. But first of all, even today in our, in our, in our times, I'm sure our economy in some way is driven by the success of the crops. But even besides that, it's, it's, it's much more broad than that. It's our ability to have food. It's our ability to have <laughs> money and financial well-being. This is an extremely important problem. So Rav Schwab asks a very, very basic question. And that is, there's a very famous quote from Chazal, that our finances for the year are set on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. <coughs> so what are, we, what, what are we bothering God for? Uh, you know? Get, get, get back to me, you know, what, we'll, we'll, file, we'll put it on file for Rosh Hashanah. What, what, are, you, what are you talking to me about? He, so the, the question is a powerful question. Um, I, I think the, probably the basic answer to that question is that maybe if, if things wouldn't have been so good for us, maybe impassioned tefillah has a way of kind of tilting it a little bit, maybe what, what's set on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is, it, hold on one second, Aaron. maybe what's set on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is kind of the baseline for what's going to be, but maybe if we conduct ourselves in a uniquely positive way or dive in a uniquely meaningful way, maybe that'll be improved, maybe. Um, Rav, Rav Schwab has a very interesting suggestion. There's another famous quote associated with Parnassa, like sort of the other part of that quote, is everything is set from Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur except 
for expenditures for Shabbos and Yom Tiv, and our children's education. Whenever you give that quote today, there's a very meaningful sigh. Um, <laughs> if anyone could imagine children's education costing any money. Um, <laughs> but so he, he suggests, the, I don't know, so the, the basic meaning of the quote is, the way it's normally taken is if I put more money into having a nice Shabbos or a nice Yom Tiv or really seeing to it that my children have uh, the best you know, religious education I can get them, then that like is not on the tab. That, 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 that's the normal way that it's understood. Um, the way Rav Schwab suggests it should be understood is that the wherewithal we'll have for these mitzvah expenditures of Shabbos and education, things like that, is very much rooted in our passion and our focus and our tefillah day to day, week to week. In other words, that, that theoretically speaking, again, all of this is far too complicated for us to necessarily see clearly, but theoretically speaking, a person, could, it could be that a person is supposed to earn X number of dollars for the year, and that is set. With the one thing being that for these mitzvah, mitzvah expenditures of his Shabbos or his children's education or whatever else we might be talking about, if there's powerful tefillah as a merit, and not just tefillah, but that the person conducts themselves in a manner of great honor for Shabbos, etc., then at that time, at that juncture, they could merit better financial ability to take care of those things that are clearly so meaningful to them. Just an interesting thing to think about. Um, okay. So, if people want to fill out their tuition assistance forms and put on the end, <laughs> I had special kavod on Baruch Aleinu. They can, uh, <laughs> Baruch Aleinu Hashem Elokeinu Es Hashem Ra'azos. Bless upon us, Hashem, our God, this year, and all the different types of grain, which again, in our society, but we're not agricultural, specific language, all the different types of grain probably takes on a whole different meaning in our minds. Whatever, whatever, it could be the stock market. You know, it could be so many different things. It should, it should be, right, you know, it should be for good, there's a, a difference here depending on whether it's, it's a rain-oriented season or not, what exactly we say next. But we're saying this time of year, give your blessing on the face of the earth. Isn't that an interesting, we're used to saying it, but isn't that an interesting phrase? Give your blessing on the face of the earth. Sort of a strange phrase. So the Rebbe Yakar cites an interesting medrash. I believe the context of this Pasuk, I didn't have a chance to look it up, but I, but I believe the context is by the famine uh, in the times of Yosef and his brothers. I could be wrong about that, but the Pasuk in any event says, <laughs> The famine was on the entire face of the land. Mm. Same thing, this thing, the face of the land. What's that about the face of the land? So the Medrash Tanhuma says that the face of the land refers to the wealthy of the land. Why? Because the wealthy of the land, if the wealthy do well, they hopefully have the ability to share their wealth with those in greater need. So the point in the Pasuk is the famine was so great that it even extended to the face. You know, I, I guess the point of the face is the more, the, the, the aspect of land that stands out more, you know, that which is more dependent on the land. So. The Reubar Yucker takes that medrash and applies it here that the meaning of the face of the land is we ask that God should grant financial well being to those who are more successful and by extension should inspire those people. I believe this is what the Reubar Yucker means should inspire those people to share their wealth with people in greater need. That's an interesting way of looking at the phrase. Oh, the trickle down theory. Trickle down theory. <laughs> oh, and you were just in the Republican nomination for president? Hey! That's the. Start praying. <laughs> um, okay. So, Al Kopneu Adama. And it, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about in the context of this bracha that we say to God, you should bring financial well being in whatever way. If that, if that is bringing a bumper crop, and that everyone is directly affected, if that's helping certain people become uniquely wealthy and either 
the more benevolent people are the ones who become uniquely wealthy, or you inspire the uniquely wealthy people to be generous with, with, with their possessions, that's also from God. So just an interesting way of thinking about it. To the best of my knowledge, there is no reference in this bracha to tax rates. I just want to... Um, years of corn. Years of corn. Visabeinu mituvecha. And satiate us from your good. Now, the straightforward meaning of this phrase is that which we have, that which we receive, should nourish us. I'm just going to close those doors if you don't mind. Okay, for those people watching the video, what actually just happened is there was an eruption of crabs that just came in. <laughs> we had to close the doors. But, um, Visabeinu mituvecha, satiate us from your good. The standard meaning of this would be, you know, make us be full from that which you give us. So Rav Schwab suggests something else. Help us be happy with that which you give us. Mm. That's right. How, how many times are people... How many times do people have such a challenge being satisfied with what they have? Uh, and by the way, one could, one could apply it in many different ways. There are so many people who actually might have sufficient funds to cover their needs. Maybe they don't have the wherewithal or budgetary understanding to figure out how to, how to maximize their funds and things of that sort. I mean, all of this could fall under Vesabeinu Mituvecha. Help us be satiated, whether it be in our own outlook, whether it be in filling our needs, whether it be in outside expenses, right? I mean, you know, there are times where people are, are making it and then they have some expense out of left field and that totally takes them for a loop. That could also be, help us be satiated from that which you give us. Bless our years like the good years. I have to confess, maybe I'm the only one in the room, until today, I misunderstood the meaning of this phrase. I thought that kashoni matavos meant, gosh, I bet in the past there were these good years, and let, it, let this year be like one of the good years. So the Mepharshim explained, it's based on Pesukim and Yoel, that talk about a time in the future that God will bless us with, with uniquely good years. So the Pshat is, kashoni matavos. You know, there are Pesukim and Yoel that talk about these years of great abundance that God will grant the world, let this year be like one of those years. That, that's, that's, uh, that's the pshat. That's the pshat what we're saying in the bracha. Baruch uh, Hashem mivarei chashanim. We, we, we recognize him as being the one who blesses the years. Any he... comment? Oh, yes, Arnold, thank you. Oh, Did you want to say thank you very much? That was, no. Did I already address it? Yeah, no, let it go, it's okay. You sure? I, I just wasn't paying attention to some white book of Baruch Hashanim, but I forgot all about it. I okay. can't give it a name twice. Okay. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone. Anyone else? Uh? I just want to comment on your time issue about um, God determining as the uh, on Yom Kippur, and then uh, you know that happening first, and then we're dominating during the course of the year. And I think that same question could be asked about you know. It's not just about money. And to me, the, this is just my personal view, but the answer is that God is outside of time. The question assumes that God is operating in human time. And so Rosh Hashanah comes before you know, Purim. But for God, Rosh Hashanah doesn't come before Purim. God is outside of time. God created time. So on Rosh Hashanah, God knows what we're going to be doing on Purim. And so it's possible in God's world to make a decision on Rosh Hashanah that takes into account what we're going to be doing after Rosh Hashanah. That's a very, um, thank you for sharing that. I have to wrap my mind around it a little bit, but I, no, 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 it's, it's very, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Mr. Meyer. Yeah, we're, is it a summer or winter? You change the word. How come we don't do anything about a leap year? Um, I'm, I'm because we're, we're asking for a good year, 
going to have a year or 13 months. Right. I mean, the truth, the, the, the truth is that actually this is a very unique thing within davening in general, within halakha in general, because actually what we do is based on not the lunar, not the lunar calendar, but the solar calendar. Right, so in other words, it's, 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 I don't know how, I don't know how strong the relation is. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is we're, we're formatting this bracha based on the general rain season. And I, I, am I responding to it? Did I not, did I not understand your point? Well, I, I might make, uh, my basic question is, why is there no reference to a year that has an extra month? I'm not sure I understand why there should be a reference to it. Because we're, we're blessing the year, and this year has uh, more potential to be good. Has extra month to be good. Well, listen, God should bring us blessing day by day, week by week, month by month. What I think, what I think is, is an interesting point that you're touching on, I think it's kind of related to what you're touching on, and I'm not sure what the answer is to this unless maybe there's a puzzle this way. Why do we talk about the year at all? I mean, that's kind of like the, 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 the trickle down of what you're talking about. Why, why are we talking about a year at all? Baruch Aleinu Hashem Elokeinu. Baruch Aleinu Hashem Elokeinu Eswa Bless the land for us. You know, why are, we, why are we focused on the year? There's a great reference here to years, a very strong reference here to years, which is an interesting thing. Uh, someone has a comment on that? Well, the the year is, I, I, I just going to say that the purpose of the leap year is to keep us in the right season. Right. So, so it follows yeah. that we should, right. But it, Thank you. But there is an adjustment looking at it for a, because it is, it is solar, there is an adjustment for leap year, but it's not the Jewish leap year, it's the civil leap year. Right. It's one day different right. for that. So there is, you know, because it follows a, a solar right. cycle. Right. That's true. That's true. Yeah, thank you. But we're also changing the words based on the seasons. So that's a year. So that's interesting. So that, that, that could be why we're focusing on the year. It's, by the way, a fascinating statement, somewhat of a hashkafic statement within that. I don't know, hashkafic, but like the way of the world type of statement. That, you know, sometimes things are more plentiful, sometimes things are less plentiful, but that sometimes is the cycle of the year. I mean, there's something very powerful if you imagine an agricultural-based society during a time where they're not harvesting the crops, that a person is davening that everything should go well. Or maybe just after they harvested the crops, what, what am I davening for now? But we're seeing it all as part of a broad unit. That's actually, when you think about it, if you think of this as an agricultural bracha, which it clearly is from the context of changing the text of the bracha based on the time of year, um, it's fascinating that regardless of the time of year, the basic request of God is the same. So we tweak it a little bit for the rain season. But I think there's a very powerful statement. There are, you know, there are times of plenty, there are times of less, and yet we, our request to God is the same. Uh, you know what I mean? I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, Max. Uh, the other remark about the, the year, when we are Shoshana, we the bit of what's going to happen. We experience time in certain ways. Maybe we experience it most when we ask for the next year. Uh, and we, so we are asking that he bless it each year, and we're asking that he blesses that every Rosh Hashanah. Maybe that's how we experience time and, and clusters that way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you. But I mean, it's interesting that specifically this bracha, you know, we, we didn't say, Rufoenu Hashem b'nei Rafei Hashanah Hazos. You know what I mean? It's like, it's interesting that, but again, the agricultural economy, it does make sense that we should be more cyclical oriented in our thinking. You know, I, I, think, I think that's a fair point. Nancy? I, I think the year, the reference to the year is very important, um, particularly in an um, agrarian economy, but I think even for us, um, not only is it important that there is a cycle, if the rain comes too early, if there's too much rain, if there's too little rain, if it comes late, even a few days can make a world of difference in whether we will be, we will have enough this year or not. Mm -hmm. And I think a sensitivity to those changes, um, I'm probably one of the only people who, who didn't really enjoy living in Los Angeles <laughs> because I real I miss the seasons. I miss the you know the thrill of surviving another winter and getting to the spring. 
or, or, or the fall, the sadness of seeing the leaves fall. There's, we, we're more human because we feel time passing. If we don't feel time passing, uh, in a way we're not Thank you we, very much. We don't appreciate it. That's very nice. And, and can I surmise from what you've said? that anyone who needs help shoveling their snow this winter should contact you. Absolutely. <laughs> I, will, I will cheer them on. <laughs> uh, I just have a business-oriented comment about this. And I would say that, you know, if anybody is in business, they're always worrying. Am I going to have a good year or am I going to have a bad year? Always worrying. And, you know, I think that I think that, that is a concept that's embedded in here, is that every day, Every day that throughout the year we wanna we wanna thank God and praise him and appreciate that you know we are having a good year, we wanna pray for a good year. And you know, and that's the way we think. I mean our business minds, when it comes to money, when it comes to prosperity, when it comes to growth, was this a good year? Are we growing this year? Are we are, are we shrinking? What where are we? So I, I think it it makes more sense if you kind of Thank you very much. I just wanna make a comment also that the discussion was raised last week, which I think is a very fair point. Always the same text of Tefillah. Just, I was just thinking when you were saying that, imagine a person who makes the deal of a lifetime and a person who, heaven forbid, just lost their job, say the exact same bracha in Shemona Esrei Baruch Aleinu as a Shana Azos. Something very, you know, kind of what you said hit, hit me like that. There's something very striking about that. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you very much. For the one business day, but also for thank you very much. Uh, I'm just looking to the text and say something about not only make it good, but also for us to recognize the good in it. You know, from yeah. you know, uh, you know, it, from the goodness, we should be satisfied and bless this year as the best of years, so that we can not only is it objectively, but maybe even more that, that whatever we have, we can see. As, as having that certain Thank quality. you very much. So, right, that, that I think is at least partially connoted by make us satiated. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking, I didn't say this, I was also thinking the language of Bari Halenu is an interesting thing. Bless upon us. Why don't we just say Bari Hashem Lokeinu Es Ha'adamba? Bless the land, but uh, maybe it's a little bit like what you're talking about, that we should, we should see it as a bracha. And we should, we should Appreciate what we have. I think that's kind of what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, there seems to be two years of on previous praise. I believe uh, in Israel, most of this is one of my views. I believe Rav Lopiansky and I guess uh, uh, Rav Sachs, uh, Sidor has Mitubha versus Mitubha. And there's, I mean, I would see it if you're in Israel. You're thinking about the land yeah. and her goodness, because yeah. that is what it's referring to yeah. from the previous phrase. Yeah. And yet, if we are in Galut, um, yeah. the produce of Israel may not be, maybe that's the reason there are two years so Yeah, there is know. discussion about the two different texts, Vesabeinu Mutuvah versus Vesabeinu Mutuvecha. I'm, I'm not aware of the distinction being rooted in where one is davening. Um, you, I mean, if you I mean, look at the Israeli, I mean, from yeah, I don't, Israel yeah, on. I, yeah, but I'm saying there are definitely Sidorim not. I, 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 there's discussion. I mean, it's a very old distinction in text. It's not, it's not a new one. Um, I did not have a chance to look much into why there's that variation. I apologize. But, but there, is, there is discussion in the first about that. Yeah, thank you. I, well, it might have something to do with. Are we talking about land or are we talking about time? We're we talking about just the, the, the cycle of time for a businessman as well as a farmer. The things go up and down. So the blessing or the, or the satiation that we're ask, asking for doesn't come necessarily from the land, its land, the feminine tuba, but um, from God's goodness. That, that the source, it, it's a reaffirmation of our faith that things can get better, things will get better, that the source of goodness is God. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's an interesting comment in the article about me to Becha. It says, but the, the uh, cult of his body, he says, not from earnings uh, to which we are not entitled. But not, in other words, El got me gains. So, in other words, the Sabeni me to Becha, satiate us from your bounty and not from, not from bounty that maybe he's going to. That's interesting. 
That's <laughs> interesting thing to, to be misspell for. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, I think maybe this will be the last comment and then we'll hold it. The yeah. is in, in the plural, uh, uh, the whole thing is it's about us and our. Yeah. Is it appropriate? to think in terms of my needs and my success? So it seems the general approach to tefillah is, uh, we of course think about ourselves, that's, that's human nature, and that's what's going to be most meaningful for us. But when I, instead of asking for myself, I should always be asking for us. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the mode of tefillah in general. That's the mode of tefillah in general. Uh, just one thing, if I, if I may close with this, the, when Mr. Abrams was saying it just now, it kind of hit me in a way, we, not, not, not to tip my hand in, in economic philosophies, but we, um, you already, yeah, yeah, we, we, um, in the end of the day, if God brings us financial success, our belief, whether or not that should be the law, that, I and mean, that's the whole concept of Stucca, our belief is that within our people, if there's financial success within our people, it should spread all the way around. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing. There's also very halayim, you know, like, bless on us. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, again, if you think about, like, hashkafa coming out, something, reminding ourselves of things. At the end of the day, if we have bracha, it's our responsibility, the same way we spoke about the pneu the mother, the more wealthy people, it's our responsibility to share with everybody. Friends, it should be that, Karish Baruch Hu could theoretically, again, Actually, I don't think this is the way it works, but theoretically, it should be that Gosh Baruch can figure out how much resources he should distribute to the Jewish community of, of Greater Washington. And that should be able to, you know, if, if we're all doing what we're supposed to do, if we're giving what we're supposed to give, if we're, if we're receiving what we're supposed to receive, it should all be able to work itself out. Now, that, that's utopian. I'm not, I'm not saying that's actually, but, but it's a fascinating thing to think about. It's a fascinating thing to think about. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. All right.